That's it. Well, what else are you going to do? <laughs> Nothing, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. Like, you just go out and you're like, otherwise, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're just going to say, I'm going to start next week. It's a diet. Mm. It's a fucking diet. Do you know what I mean? If you're going to eat cream cakes and you're just going to keep putting weight on, the only way you're going to stop putting weight on is if you stop eating cream cakes. It's just reverse of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're never going to get anywhere if you don't start or you don't stop. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Running From Comfort. Today's show, our guest is Robbie Bell. Now, Robbie is a chef from the UK who's turned into a bit of an entrepreneur, and he runs his business, City Larder. As well as that, he has his very own podcast, which I highly recommend you check out. It is called Cooking the Books. On that show, Robbie has on some of Australia's biggest and most well-known chefs, as well as other chefs from around the world, and they just cut the mustard about food and everything else to do with the hospitality industry. So check that one out. It is a really good podcast. It has my recommendation. Now, in terms of today's show, you're going to hear about Robbie's story. You're going to hear about how he built his business from nothing. And not only that, he had a newborn child at the time. So today, I talked to Robbie about what it was like for him building that business from nothing. As well as that, we talk a little bit about his backstory because, you know, like I always like to say... We are all shaped from all of our previous and past experiences, and it's what makes us who we are today. So I get to talk to Robbie a little bit about his backstory as well, just so I can really get to understand who he is. Now, finally, if you enjoy today's show, do not forget to give it a rating and a review, and make sure you subscribe for future episodes. And if this is your first time listening, don't forget to go back through the catalog, check out some previous episodes. I've had some incredible guests on here. If you were just listening and you're just chilling at home, not doing anything, Head on over to my YouTube channel, check out the video of this interview, you get to see our lovely faces, and you also get to see Robbie's fish in the background. Alright, enough of me talking, let's get on with today's show. So Robbie, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. So, just, why don't you just introduce yourself briefly, tell a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your backstory. Yeah, so, like you say, Robbie Bell from England, uh, spent 25 years in the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, outside caterers, covered most areas of the hospitality industry, in the kitchen, I should add, yeah, not up not front of the house, I ain't got the face for it. But, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. don't cut yourself short. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, and learn, my, learn my craft, basically. Prior to that, I've always, I was always selling things, wanted to, selling t-shirts to my mates, selling gobstoppers at the school, selling ciggies behind the, behind the, the bike sheds at school. Can I interject just quickly? I used to do that, so probably my first little business little scam was... Start of grade 11, I used to buy everybody cigarettes in the morning. They'd let me keep the change and pocket some ciggies. Yeah, so I was always selling stuff. Then I wanted to, then I wanted to become a chef, so I trained to be a chef. And then um, always, I did a pop-up restaurant, um, always trying to dabble a little bit. And always, every restaurant I was in, working at, I was always interested in the business side, making the money, the purchasing, and just the general running of it and just trying to do the maths and writing business plans. It's a hobby of mine and still to this day I write business plans all the time. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I just did that. And then I got, we had a baby, um, in, 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 in 2000, oh shit, was it 2014? Yeah, 20, oh, you should know when your baby yeah, is born. Yeah, 20, 2014. <laughs> Hope the wife's not listening to this one. <laughs> November 2014. And, um, realized that I needed to, to start a business, I couldn't keep working in the restaurant. The restaurant game is a really tough game, especially for mm. married and relationships, and especially if you've got children, it's a really tough game. So I was like, I can't keep doing this. And um, yeah, we started City Ladder, and that's kind of where we're at now. Yeah, and so I'll just take it back a little bit, because what I want to actually ask you first is, I understand hospitality is a very tough industry. If yeah. you had to just name what's the toughest part about it, what would you say it is? Mm, probably the hours. Mm. Yeah, well, maybe not these days, but I'm going. I can only refer when I was there. The hours are really tough, and you know, missing out socially—that's that's really tough. Mm. But you love it as well. That's the only that's the thing you love it. Mm. So it, you, the the tough way, the missing out on things is like the birthdays and things, and you just can't get them off. Do you know what I mean? The actual nights, I guess. For, like I, I'm like waffling a bit here, but no, go for I it. was. I would still be in that industry if I hadn't have had Monty, probably. My wife was in that industry as well. She was mm. front of the house, so she would probably still be on the floor if I hadn't had my son. I love that industry. I love it. So when I say it was tough, 
it wasn't actually tough for me. I just know it's a tough industry. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Like, it wasn't tough for me. What is it about it that you love so much? Just the hustle, the bustle, the giving, the, the, the nature. And it's, if it's in your nature, if you're a giving person, if someone comes around your house and you have a party and you want everyone to have a good time, just in you, you know, like the fridge is open. If friends come around and the fridge is open, they're going to have what they want. If you're in the hospitality and giving is, is your nature, well then, you know, that's, that's what I love. That's what I love about it. That's awesome. And in terms of that, would you say then that the hospitality industry almost gave you a good sort of, I don't know, got you sort of ready for business in the sense that you already had the long hours in you? Oh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I've never really thought of it like that. But yeah, probably, yeah. Like, I've always said, one of my friends said, that you say, oh, the hours, the hours, the hours, the hours. And I said, well, what else would you be doing? And I, and I still do that to this day, like... If you're not working, what else are you doing? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. That's it. Like, what else is there? Really? I don't know. Playing video games, watching Netflix. <laughs> I mean, I'm just not Going for long strolls. Yeah. <laughs> not I, your thing. No, I like to be building something. Mm. I always got to be building something. I want to be growing. I want to be like even when I was a chef. Every night I would get home and read cookbooks. Even like one in the morning, I'd always try and open up a cookbook before I go to bed and flick through and read a few recipes, study the books, know where all the recipes were within the books. Mm. You know, so if I needed a such a juice of artichoke soup, I could fl- fl- flick through Tom Aitken's. I know, that, and I know there's a juice of artichoke soup in Tom Aitken's book. I'm pretty sure there is. So I can still, you know, I'd flick through, remember, so I could always refer back to books. And I've always just been interested in building things. Mm. Yeah, and what what got you sparked in this interest in cooking, like? Probably grandparents. My, yeah. my grandmother, yeah. She was... And actually, the cooking side, I'm interested in, obviously, but I'm really interested in taking a secondary product and turn it into a pre- premium product. That's what I'm really interested in. So, like, it's not necessarily the cooking that I'm interested in. It's like, if you see a big pile of mushrooms mm. and a big... Yeah, let's just say a big pile of onions and a big pile of leeks and a big pile of potatoes let's just say for instance and then three hours later you come back and you've got pans of soup pans of leek and potato soup mm. and that's what I'm interested in that process how do you get that raw product to this consumer product does that make sense yeah so yeah. sort of your mindset's all about like getting it to that point of change I guess and yeah then... and turning like this product that's $20 into this product that's now $60 that's what I'm interested in. And did you think about it like that when you were working in the industry uh, as well? Probably not as much as I do. As I've, as I've learned over the time, that's what I'm interested in. Okay. It took me a while to learn that that's actually what the palm is. I always used to look at capsicums and like say we're making harissa and I'd look at the box, big massive box of capsicums and then I'd look at and then like, if, you know, a couple hours later we'd have like a tub of harissa. I'd be like, I like that. I don't know why, I just like that. So what is that? You said harissa. What is that dish? Like a spicy, like a spicy red pepper sauce. Oh, okay. Yeah, like a like a sauce, like a dip, like a, a mar- it can be a marinade. It can be a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. But yeah, that's the process of life. That's awesome. So then, going through, so going through your life, so you've lived in a fair few different areas. You've got a lot of exposure um, to a, you know different areas of the industry, I suppose. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of the different places you've lived and maybe what you might have learnt? in those places yeah for sure um, I learned in the cities like I, I started my apprenticeship in a I wouldn't say a village but a small town mm. and it was very like cosy and everyone was supporting each other and it was, it was a really good environment and then I moved to a city like Manchester where everyone's a little bit more dog eat dog do you, do you know what I mean a, yeah. little bit, a little bit more aggressive everyone's so, trying to get ahead Everyone's trying to get ahead. You're a bit like Melbourne. No, I... You don't think Melbourne's No, up? I definitely I don't. I definitely don't. And then I was going to say, then I come to Australia, and everyone's... Re- and where I worked, I don't know everywhere. I haven't worked in every restaurant or whatever, but where I worked, I felt like everyone everyone's really supportive again. Do you know what I mean? So they're, they're, they're some of the things that I've probably learned along the way. And regarding cooking, like, in Australia, I learned a lot about um, raw fish, heaps about raw fish, crudo, sashimi... Um, you eat a lot of raw fish and a lot more of the Asian produce over here a lot of the Chinese influence Japanese influence um, Szechuan pepper and, you know, soy sauce and wakame and uh, kombu and all these kind of different ingredients from, from Asia and then in Europe 
it's a lot more, you know, like red wine vinegar, cognac, vermouth, pernol, uh, mirepoix, a lot more, you know, back, especially back in them days, just a lot more classic French style. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of the comparisons between Europe and England. And, and Australia and obviously you've got the great fish here and, and heaps of fantastic produce but as a as a standout I would say the Asian influence here was what I learned a lot yeah okay and like for Australia compared to other parts of the world um, do you find it's maybe more like uh, what would you say multicultural in terms of like your food choices like here in Melbourne I don't think there's probably a cuisine you couldn't find mm, yeah yeah for sure um, again we're not going, referring back to it too much more the Asian side for sure like in England, we have fantastic Indian food. Like some some of the best Indian food in the world, I would probably say. We've got Mission Star Indian restaurants in England, in England, and, and, and fantastic Indian restaurants. And way over here, it's just nowhere near that standard. It just it just isn't. That's the reality. The good, the tasty, but nowhere near the standard that we have in it. And that's from like you know like uh, street food in Indian English, let's say, to mm. to one star Mission. Right the way across the board, it's it's, a, it's head and shoulders. But yet over here, the Chinese food, excuse me, the Chinese food in England as a whole is pretty average and that's being pretty generous. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's very sticky. It's very, you know, very, even though a lot of Chinese food is deep fried, but it's very gloopy, just not as good. Where here, it's, it's really fresh. So you, it's, it's a lot more traditional. It's even regional, you know, different regions yeah. and, and that. Like you get in Italy, different regions. And it's the same within China, and you, you you can feel that here in Australia. Yeah, definitely. We have that sort of vibe as well. I mean, there's almost like a place. You, you can't go anywhere in Australia without finding a Chinese restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And, and the influence, the influence that, that that does, you know, like really good chefs, like the likes of Neil Perry that, that are then bringing them techniques of deep, deep frying pigeons and deep frying whole chickens and, and using Sichuan and using different spices and, and whatnot within... His, and turn that into Aust- Australian food because you know, that's the influence mm. and in your own career did you find yourself um, doing much experimenting in terms of like the foods that you put together or mm, you know what not really I, I've never really I've always been pretty like bread and butter kind of person do mm. you know what I mean like I'm n- never like going I'm not super creative in that way I just aren't it's just not my mind doesn't really work in like pushing the boundaries Flavour combinations and, 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 and whatnot, yeah, you know, but nothing wacky, nothing like any, you know, some people you would think of being out there and anything, definitely not. Yeah, okay. And then so you said that you were always sort of really drawn to the business side of things. What got, What do you think got you interested in that? I don't know. I think um, I've, always been, I've always been into Richard Branson. I mean, I'm dyslexic. And Richard Branson also dyslexic. Mm. So as a role model when I was younger, people would use Richard Branson as a role model. My parents, my grandparents would use him as a as a as a role model. Look what he's achieved and he's dyslexic. Look what you know that gets drilled in here. And and anyone, I guess anyone, like you hear black children or, or Aboriginal children or whatever saying, you know, they didn't have anyone to look up to where now they've got superstars in AFL or in acting or in business or whatever you need them people to look up to and go if he can do it well then I can do it so that was Richard Branson was my one at the beginning and I think that's what got me interested in it I was like oh who's he and you know I knew he started a a, a magazine and then I knew he had a a, a radio a radio sorry a record shop and I read his autobiography kind of got it on audio book and uh, yeah, and that, that's kind of got my, my brain ticking, yeah. Hmm. And I just want to go on a slight tangent there because mm. I think that's very interesting, you know, how important the influence of having a role model for you was, you know, considering you said, you know, you said you're dyslexic and yeah. you're like, you know, to have someone like Richard Branson there and to be like, oh, if he can do it, I can too. That's something that I think is so powerful in the day of the internet because, I mean, if there's someone that you want to look up to, there's probably a podcast with them somewhere and then you can hear their story and you think, oh, wow, yeah, this yeah. person's not too different to me. Definitely, 100%. Well, exactly, like you say, with the internet now, there's so much information out there, and you can find out, like you say, like you can track their career step by step, or and you can follow them 
through Instagram on a day to day basis or, or, or whatever for the good or for the better for the bad I'm not sure to be honest yeah. yeah there's a degree where I think it, you know you might get too, a little bit too obsessed or you might waste too much time but also I mean and like you said as well, you can track their career. I mean, you know, if you're a crafty person out there and you think, oh, geez, I'd like to be like Richard Branson, well, I don't know, go go have a study of his career, see if you can reverse engineer it. I mean... Yeah, for sure. It, it, you know, you, yeah, you, nowadays you can fucking DM it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? You, 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 can, you can just say, this is who I am. This is what, well, back in the day, it was a letter through a such and such. A, how that, how now, many different agents as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All these kind of things. Now you can they do speaking events. Now you can just go to them and that, yeah. I will ask you, So, because um, you also have your own podcast. You want yeah. to shout that out? What's this podcast here? Cooking the Books. Cooking the Books, yeah. yeah. And you've had, you've had some high-profile chefs on there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. How did you get in contact with them? Um... A lot of them are friends. Okay. Yeah, quite a few of them are my friends. Because uh, I've been in the industry quite a, quite a long time. Suppliers who we use and suppliers uh, who I've seen on Instagram and, what, or, and whatnot. Farmers markets. Mm. Some of the people that I've met at farmers markets. Uh, friends of friends. And then some, how did I get, the biggest person we've had on the podcast is Ben Shuey, for sure. He's mm. like, he just, his restaurant just won best restaurant in Australia. He was in the top 50 for many years. Um, uh, how did I, uh, I'm trying to think how I got into, oh, a friend, a friend of mine was working there and he asked him, and that was it basically, and he said yes, because he eats our pate. Oh, so, okay. Ben Shuey eats our pate. He actually says it on the podcast, he said, the only reason I'm doing this is because I love your pate so much. <laughs> so, yeah, and that was it, basically. So there we yeah. go. The quality product is always going to win. Yeah, it would have got, yeah, won him over, exactly. But something important there was, I suppose, every, so everything that you've been doing, it's all about connections. And in terms, so from the podcast side of things, do you find that's the same being in business as well? A lot of it's about the connections that you had? Yeah, I think so. But we didn't have any connections in the beginning. That was a thing. You've got to build them relationships. Do you know what I mean? And you and there can't be fake relationships. There've got to be true relationships. You've got to go out your way. You've got to bend over backwards to, to help people out and, and show that you're keen and show that you're eager and show that you'll go the extra mile when they need it. At the beginning, you need to create the relationships. Like I said, we didn't have any contacts. Yeah. So in the, in the sales, I'm talking. I, obviously, I've got um, contacts within the industry, the cooking industry, the restaurant industry. Mm. But not in we where we then went on to be a wholesaler for retail, and I was never in retail. Yeah. So tell me a bit about when you started this business because you did build it up from nothing, and you know I'm pretty sure like you know a lot of people they kind of flirt or dream of the idea of starting a business, and a lot of people don't know how. A lot of people might use the excuse that I don't ha- that I don't have anything. So you essentially built it from nothing. So how did you come about this business? I come about it because I've been making terrines for a lot of years. Terry Laybourne, shout out to Terry Laybourne. He trained me how to do it. He was, a, he was an incredibly talented chef from England. He's got multiple restaurants and he's brought on so many young guys and he trained super well. He trained me how to do it and how to make them. And I made them as, as a Christmas hamper for the staff. Like I said, just after Monty was born, I made it these Christmas hampers for the staff. One of the girls, Amy, said you should do that as a, as a, as a, as a business. I'd been trying, like I said, again, at the, at the beginning, I'd be, I always write business plans and I wrote a business plan for a cafe or a pizzeria, fine dining, you know, all these different things. And I just couldn't get them to work. I couldn't get them to work for many reasons. Labor, cost, no scalability. Uh, no, no cash to start it off. These kind of things. So I was like, "What am I going to do?" Amy said that. I thought, "Well, that's a pretty good." Uh, yeah, like I enjoy making them. No one else is really doing it at the standard that I can do it at. Um, it's an easy entry to market. You don't need to buy, you know, a big restaurant with X amount of seats and a bar and stock and a cellar and this and that and the other and a minimum amount of staff. You know, even in a small restaurant, you need fucking four staff do you know what I mean you're going to need two in the kitchen two front of house let's just say that's in a small restaurant do you know what I mean so you need even just to open the doors you need four staff and X amount of chairs and whatnot. so where are you going to get that cash from when you don't have it so it was really easy um, entry to market and it just all worked out so and then I just then we we just went went after it basically and and, and, and got going on it and we did the the maths worked it all out and, 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 and just went started going knocking door to door you know like Went to the market, 
He started yeah. off door to door. Door to door, just went down to South Melbourne Market, Emerald Deli, first customer, went down. My wife went down, I was making them, my wife went down. She worked front of house anyway. She was on, she just had a baby, just had a fucking mm. baby at this point, so we've got the baby. Have you got the baby with you when you're doing this? Sometimes. Beck used to take the baby. Mm. We used to do deliveries with me driving. Beck in the passenger seat, Monty asleep in his carrier, three of us with an esky in the boot. Back in the day. Like, fucking totally, like, just pounding the pavement, you know? Like, and then we just sold one to Wendell Deli in South Melbourne Market. And I said, she said, ring me next week. And she said, oh, I'll take another one. It sold well. So then we got got in touch with her we got in touch with her again yeah and that, that we sold her a few weeks and then we're like well let's get another customer let's get another customer and let's get another customer and then and it just kept building and we just get a snowball effect snowball effect you know like so that was now we've got like I don't know over 300 mm. you know like from Cairns to Adelaide three dis- two distributors one in South Australia and then the same we use Fino Foods who were in New South Wales and in in uh, Queensland that we use the same distributor for both states yeah and just slowly man but fuck it's hard I mean it's really 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 hard incredibly difficult you're always going at it just chipping away and, and always growing you know we started off our first delivery we didn't even have a tax invoice we didn't know how to do a tax invoice on the way to do the delivery we pulled into office works got a tax invoice book and we wrote it out on the way we didn't have a tax invoice you know and then we went from that and then we got some branded ones Mm. And then we went from branding ones to zero, moments we could have thought of zero, and then we could do, then we could print the invoices out. Do you know what I mean? And then we got, to, and we just built and built and built. So when, so when you started, there was obviously a lot of things you didn't, you hadn't sort of figured out. Did you go in knowing that you were just going to figure this out as you went along? Yeah, yeah. Simple answer. That's it. You just dove in. That's it. Well, what else are you going to do? <laughs> Nothing, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just go out and you like. Otherwise, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're just going to say, I'm going to start next week. It's a diet. Mm. It's a fucking diet. Do you know what I mean? If you're going to eat cream cakes and you're just going to keep putting weight on, the only way you're going to stop putting weight on is if you stop eating the cream cakes. It's just reverse of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're never going to get anywhere if you don't start or you don't stop. Mm. Simple as that. you just got to get after it. I suppose what a lot of people lack is that mindset in terms of just taking action. And like you said, it's very much just like a diet. It's no different. It, I suppose it doesn't matter what your goals really are. It's just all about making sure that you just take the action. And if you worry that you haven't got it all figured out, I mean, here you are. You, and did you have any sales experience when you were no. doing door to door knock? No. Yeah. You're just going around the markets. Hey, here's my product. Would you like to buy some? See? Just pure logic at the end of the day. That's See? all it was. Just pure what else, logic. What else do you have to do? I don't, <laughs> nothing else complicated, is it? You've got a product. Is it good? Do you believe in it? Be honest with yourself. Do you believe in it? If you believe in it, it's pretty easy. I knew that that was the best product on the market, and it's still the best product on the market to this day. Mm. You know, I, I believe in it. I know how good it is. There's no one else doing it as good as we're doing it. There's no one that can offer the service that we that we that we supply. The, the service that we supply, Rebecca, my wife, who next level service in a wholesale in a wholesale environment. Next level. There's no one as good as we are at that. It just isn't. She like she's worked at three star Michelin restaurants working on the floor, a, a place like Key, a place like Rockpool, places like Fat Dog, and these kind of places where she worked, she delivers that service in a wholesale environment. There's no one doing that. Mm. So we just make sure that we're the best of what we do. And we, we believe in ourselves. And I don't think about failing. Never, never, ever, ever. Not and even it, once. Not even once. I don't. I still don't. We're about to launch new products. We're about to launch a range of um, ready to go proteins. Not ready meals, but ready. we're going to do a 24 hour cooked free range pork belly a slow roast Ooh. duck leg mm. and a red wine braised beef cheek all in nice branding and all the rest of it we're about to launch that we spent a lot of money to put that together trying to get it organised I don't think about it failing I'm not saying it won't fail mm. maybe it will fail but I'm not going to fucking think about it failing I'm going to think about it being just getting out there and we'll just we'll get it out there we'll get it going We'll make it in, we'll run it for a year, we'll make a decision, we'll let it go through all the cycle, through all the seasons, make sure you see where it goes, and if it, if it works out, great. If it doesn't, we just put it in the bin and we move on. We don't think about it, like, we don't think about it not working or failing. What's the point? And so you're not attached to any particular idea nothing, at all? Nothing, zero. We just move forward, that is it. Like, I don't think about it. I just don't. Mm. What's the point? There's no point. No, but I mean, you know, for a lot of people, like, you know, that idea of failing, you know, I suppose it holds a lot of people back from things that they want to do. Were you always sort of like this or? Dyslexic. 
It's part of the dyslexia. Dyslexia. When you when you can't stand when you can't read, when you go to school in the eighties and in the, in the early nineties, and the, no one helps you, and you go into class, and the, all the room is like on the on the board. It's all written out in science, and it's all written in. It could be in fucking. Chinese or fucking Japanese or any language in the world because you don't know what's going on and you sit down and they're like okay just read that follow the steps and away you go when you've had that all your life then like you know, you're not you know what I mean so all this do you know what I mean how I don't did, if you don't mind me asking how did you go in school like I didn't get any exam nothing zero nothing so what I, what I might say here is that you've almost sort of gotten the opposite effect. I think uh, a lot of where our fear of failure comes from is the conditioning that we get in school. Because you know, I remember you know my experience in school was always make sure you get good grades. If you don't get good grades, you won't go to university. You won't get a good job. That's kind of what, sort of like a dream, or well, not a dream, but sort of like the life that we're all sort of brought up in. And then. I suppose the idea of failing, you know, for my parents, if I was to fail anything, it would be I'd get my ass whooped by dad. Would you? <laughs> I'd get whooped. I remember oh, one of one of the few things that um <laughs> I, I copped a whooping once from um not doing so well with my grades when I was a bit younger, you know. So yeah, no, no, I don't give a fuck. And <laughs> I don't give a fuck about that. And like, I don't, I just don't. Like, I just like I, I'm. Yeah, great parenting, I guess. Great, great parenting from my mother. Great mm. parenting from my grandmother. Never, never any pressure about um, work ethic is the most important thing. Grades mm. don't matter. Grades do, just don't matter. Like people think they do, they don't matter. But if you can outwork anyone, I used to always say when I was in the kitchen, there might be better chefs here, but I'll just start earlier and I'll just finish later than it. It doesn't bother me. I'll outwork it. You know, if I'll do seven days when you're, you know, I'll do twenty-one days straight, no problem. I'll, I'll you know what I mean? I'll just outwork everyone. I used to say that all the time. Like, you might be better, but you can't work as hard. Yeah. And what kind of, just on average, like, how many hours do you think you usually put in a week? Uh, I run a business. It's just never off. You never, like, maybe I'll sit down. I tell a lot, I do love Survivor. Do you know, do you know Survivor? Mm. I love Survivor. So I definitely watch Survivor and I love a bath. So I try and have a bath every night. For mm. about a, for a good hour, every night everyone's like ah oh, for an hour. Even in the summer, I just love it. Like I just, it's a good place for me to relax. And, and I've got a bit of a thing about a heat shock proteins. A little bit of a thing. I think it's good for your for your um, age, reducing your age and things. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. I just Dr. Rhonda Patrick on the Joe Rogan podcast. I watched that <laughs> one time. I was like, fuck, that sounds good to me. If I just got to sit in the bath for an hour, <laughs> I'm, I'm sticking with that one. The fountain so, of youth. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, and I have a little bit with a little bit of time. I don't know. I don't count fucking a lot. So a lot. let's just say you're always working. Yeah, always. Bar working. an hour and a half every week. <laughs> a couple of hours, a couple of hours a day. Yeah. Sorry, an hour and a half every day. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, it, just because it's not because it's a job. Like I, I say, I say all the time. I retired at thirty-five. Mm. I retired. That was it. I'm done. Like uh, now, I work for myself. It's not. It's not really a job. Like. We're building a business. That's fucking fun. Do you know what I mean? If you're mm. building a football team, is that on a you know, or you're building as a hobby? This is a hobby, I guess, for me. But it is. It's a hobby. I'm not joking. Like it's hard and everything, but we're working for our. I work, but me and my wife. When I say I, it's definitely we. She plays as big a role as I do, by if not more. Like without, it's a team at the end of the day. Mm. Without her. It wouldn't run without me. It wouldn't run. It's as simple as that. It's a, it's a classic team. It's a front and back restaurant style. I run the kitchen. She runs the front of the house. Same thing. I run the kitchen and the food and all that kind of operations. And she runs the packaging and and uh, you know distribution. And then we do the finances together. That's kind of how it, that's the role that we work. And we are working for ourselves. No one. No one uh, to answer to creating money from a business that we created out of nothing mm. that supports us and our family and ten other st- well eight other staff like it's a fucking dream come true isn't it mm. so true. there's no way you'd ever look at it at work look at it as work I say I'm going to work but not really like uh, not like it just isn't it's just not the same mm. it's not the same it's not the same as Going in and going, oh, fucking hell, who's going to, you know, like, is he going to twist at me about this? Is he going to bollock me about that? I've got to reply to that. You know, it's not like that. 
Because you're building something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's basically how I see it. And, and that's sort of the fun of the game. So in your mind, this is now just all a game of like, this is what we're building. Definitely. Mm. This is what we're building. Like, and, and trying to predict the future, you know, trying to see, follow the patterns, listen to heaps of podcasts. I listen to probably like fucking five to eight hours a day of podcasts. Every day, every day. It's like reading, you know, you say like, um, uh, really successful people read a book a week, let's say. For instance. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I try to read a book a month through Audible. I have a subscription, I've got a subscription to Audible, so I try and listen to that. And then on top of that, I try and listen to um, about five to eight hours of podcasts a day from different ones, from like motivational ones, from Gary Vee to Joe Rogan to crime to all different, all different ones, just to get different knowledge and food and heaps on and just try and sit financial ones, shares, economics, all different kinds and just trying to feel where the market is going and where society is going and trying to tune into that and be like okay where can we go like I'm right now I'm thinking about the global financial crisis that I think is potentially going to be happening in 18 yeah. months so I'm trying to make aware like okay a lot of people are predicting 12 to 18 months so I'm saying okay well then if that is the case do we need to stop in 6 months growing and just do a bit of farming instead of hunting and make a little bit of wedge of money in the in the bank and, 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 and instead of Far, uh, hunting and, 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 and growing just bring it all in and try and get a little nest egg to get us through that initial mm. stage when everyone panics at the beginning the first year everyone panics and shuts down the shop we just have that nest egg to just push us through so I'm thinking about these things all the time mm. so and that's, that's very important because I suppose what we have today is we have the opportunity to just educate ourselves for free because I would imagine you pay for none of those podcasts no I don't know free, yeah and you get to figure everything out. So there you go, people. And oh, you're listening right now, so you get a little bit of knowledge here. Yeah, well, it's exactly. I mean, we, I mean, if you didn't know already, we just learnt the next financial crisis is happening in the next twelve to eighteen months. Well, that's what they're predicting. A lot of the financial podcasters are saying that. Looking at the numbers, it's the first time these numbers have happened in in ten years, and the last time it did happen, these numbers happened twice in a row. That the the, the there was a financial crisis eighteen months later, and this, that, the other. So. It's just something to bear in mind. Do you know what I mean? You, you need to be on, have your finger on the pulse. And, and, and if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Maybe you can just listen to it along there. And what you were saying about the podcast, I think it's really interesting. Like, and I've said it before about being dyslexic. My true educational journey didn't start to podcasts. Mm. So that's where you started getting all your knowledge. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Okay. And was that because uh, I guess it was a bit harder for you to read? Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly? What, everything else is books or TV or documentaries, but you can't really tune in exactly what you want. Nowadays with podcasts, you can just find the, the people that you're interested in and just listen to them or audio books, and, and you can find like all strate- strate- uh, strategic people or business people. And, where people would know that you'd have to read them books. You don't even have to read them these days. And were you getting into podcasts before you started your business? Yeah, I've been listening to Joe Rogan for ever. Mm. Like, I couldn't tell you. I'd, I'd, I'd be lying if I give you a date. I think it, I think it was about 2012, I think, mm. 2011. But maybe I'm wrong. It was round about then. Yeah, when I first got back. Do you think you'd have a business now if you hadn't gotten sort of extra education from the podcast? Or? I don't think we'd be as successful as we are. Mm. Yeah, I think I probably would have done. Excuse me. Um, but... All, the, all my knowledge... I, I listen, I didn't even have listened to Gary Vee a lot like fucking so much mm. and I and I and I, and I, and I, uh, I shout out Gary V yeah <laughs> I um, I implement a lot of his strategies mm. but just trying to because he's from the wine background as well away from restaurants so I, I feel there's a bit of a connection there um, and I believe in what he says he's, he's also he, he, I think he's dyslexic as well so he, he can't read or write very well even if he's not dyslexic he can't read or write very well so we have a bit I feel like there's a bit of a connection there and the mentality and the way he was parented I think is pretty similar as well in a lot of aspects mm-hmm. very positive never got bollocked for not pulling good grades like mm-hmm. these kind of things are pretty similar yeah and I suppose what else is very powerful as well about advice from somebody like Gary Vee is what I find is it applies to just so many different aspects. Like it could apply to so many different businesses. It could apply to like so many different points in life. Like anything that um, sort of Gary's pushing, it's you can apply it to like, well, yeah, I've already just said it, anything really. It's, yeah, yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, and, and just being nice, right? I like that the one that you always say. I, I think it was him. I listen to so many, I get mixed up who said what. But it's like, we're not trying, we're not, oh, what does he say? Fucking hell. It's like, with about the kids, he's like, we're not teaching them to look like the good. We're teaching them to be good. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Public, private school kids in the blazers, looking like they're all, you know, a fucking ice wouldn't melt in the mouth or whatever it mm. might be. Where meanwhile, they're all fucking de- not all. I'm just saying they're all behind the parents' backs doing drugs or yeah. whatever just the same as the other kids but they look like the good people and then the other kids who don't have as much money a bit scruffy ripped trousers this that the other who maybe really are nice kids do you know what I mean we're trying to make them just yeah. make, you're not trying to look like you're nice you're trying to be nice and I suppose the other thing too you know you're talking about like the private school kids I think the kids that get more from their parents they're going to be inherently at a disadvantage now I'm kind of smack bang in the middle where I'm like my parents kind of somewhat sort of spoiled me a little bit, but they also made me try and earn stuff. So for me, sometimes I can, I find I struggle a little bit motivating myself to get certain things done. And I think especially, you know, the kids that were spoiled more are really going to struggle, especially when they hit the real world because the real world just doesn't give out like mummy and daddy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's in your DNA. I think it's in your DNA. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. And I got, but about the private school kids and that, I am knocking them and there's millions of them that are really, really nice. I, I was just using that as an example yeah. of like the look in the blazer to the kid in his, you know, hoodie. That's kind of the, 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 the thing I was giving. Yeah. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying about the rich kids being given everything and, and don't understand that they've got to work, but I don't really know. I don't know enough about that to mm. be totally honest with you. Um, I'm sure there's super hard working rich kids oh of then, course yeah it, exactly it's going to depend of course as to what values their parents instill in them so exactly. I know exactly. a lot of the more successful people I can't think of anybody off the top of my head but I've heard of a handful you know they've been very rich but they don't really hand their kids anything they want to yeah. teach them to earn it but I suppose what, I've, what I'm also getting at as well is I suppose if you haven't been given everything at the start of life some people see that as their disadvantage and for some that can turn into resentment to people that have been better off earlier on. But for others, I find it almost conditions them perfectly to become successful because they know that they don't get jack shit until they earn it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's true. I think that's, I think that's true. And then I also think um, if your parents are very successful, you're always in their shadow. Mm. That, that must be pretty annoying. Such yeah. and such is son, such and such is daughter, such and such is. Do you know what I mean? Like, you never have your own, your own way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I hear a lot of singers say it. Lily Allen. Lily mm. Allen once said that. I can't remember who that is. Someone that's why I mean, he's famous actor. And she used to be his. That's his daughter. And then when when she got more famous, it's like he, she, you know, she, she um. He's her dad, kind yeah. of thing. Do you know what I mean? Reverse the roles. Reverse there. the roles. Yeah, yeah. That's Lily Allen's dad. Where he used to be. That's Lily Allen. That's his daughter. See, mine, mine was uh, my cousin actually, because he was he was a bit older than me. He was a, he was a very popular lad growing up. He's looking at potentially being a UFC fighter soon as mm. well, which is very big news. But I was always Marcus's cousin. Yeah. <laughs> Every yeah, yeah. whenever I went to school, so shout out Marcus if you ever listened to the show. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to it all, so I just want to pull this back. So you know, you're talking about how what you're doing now and everything you're doing in your business, right? You're living the dream. You don't see it as work. But at the same time, you are working very hard. So what I want to ask you is, what's pro- what is what are some of the hardest things about running your own business? Mm, handing things over is, is definitely one hard thing, you know, like trusting people, making because you know you instinctively you want to do it yourself because it's it's, it's better, like you feel like it's going to be better than if someone else does it because you built these these uh, customers up. And if you hand it over to someone and they do it wrong, you still copy. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So handing things over is, is really difficult. Managing cash flow is also incredibly difficult. You know, it's endless. It's, it's honestly, it's endless. Dealing with frustration when someone reverses and hits into your van and you, you know, you cop a fucking grand bill. And it this happened? Really, you, yeah, it happens. This shit happens all the time, man. All the time. Uh, when a package, uh, uh, a $2,000 order, Goes missing, literally just goes missing on a on a being shipped from from Victoria to New South Wales, just disappears and no one, everyone's like, I don't know, I don't know. 
you just lose two grand. When the fridge compressor goes down and you lose three and a half grand's worth of stock, you know, these these kind of things are fucking difficult. Mm. And you've just got to like just keep you know, like yeah. cop it on the chin and that's it. Have you had any hard so I know your business has seen like a lot of growth. Mm. Have you had any like hard hitters that maybe almost knocked you out or in what sense like and anything like I don't know, have you had any like failures or anything along those lines or something that's gone wrong to a point where it's you know put a massive strain on the business or financially yeah no not not financially no we obviously right at the beginning we were fucking skating on thin ice and you're mm. praying that something doesn't go wrong like the turbo went on the van do you know what I mean like yeah like the turbo went on the van so we've got a fork out for a new turbo two and a half grand I think it was for the, at the time it did it, it sets you back, but it, we were always, we, yeah, we managed to always just scrape by, you know. Like I had to do some outside catering gigs for a little bit to get a little bit of extra cash coming in. Um, but no, we just fucking eat less. <laughs> just <laughs> literally, just, literally, just eat less. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or oh, man, I, back then I couldn't afford ten dollars to go boxing. Couldn't afford it. Didn't have ten dollars. Didn't have nothing. Zero. We had no fucking money. Nothing. Couldn't afford rent. We were like borrowing money off my, off my son's savings that people would give us. When he was born, we had to use his money to pay for rent and things. It was fucking, well, he had no money. We were rock bottom. But just slowly, slowly, we just chipped away, chipped away. Mm-hmm. And what, what what's that feeling like when you're sort of at rock bottom, you have nothing and you, you know, you're having to go to people and like borrow? Not people. Not people, no. Oh, it was money that we had... For my sons, than when we were when he was born, mm. you know, family give you money. Yeah, congratulations. There's two of them. Congratulations. It was that. Uh, like, um, I just feel you feel fucking scary, isn't it? Mm. It's really fucking scary. You've got a house. You've got a newborn baby. You've got a wife, and you feel like everyone's looking at you, and then you just keep saying, "We'll get there." We'll get there. Just trust me. We'll get there. That's it. Did you have a lot of doubters or? Nah. No. Nah. Who knows? Maybe. I have no idea. I have fucking. I have no. I don't. No one told me to me face. That's for fucking. That no one's ever said to me you won't be able to do it. Hmm. Um. So I'm not sure. I don't think so. I wouldn't have thought so. Everyone knows I'm pretty fucking stupid and pretty determined. <laughs> <laughs> so um. So now in terms of that, so you've kept on growing and. What, how have you been able to scale this? Oh. Simply, we've got more customers. And simply, we just plow out, we've got to plow, pound the foot, the pavement, and get more customers. That was how we scaled it. And then we just saved money mm. from the cash, the cash flow. We saved, we, you know, you put some away, put some away, and then buy another piece of equipment, which makes it easier to do it or faster to do it. And then, we employed someone right quite early. We employed someone so we could scale it. That you know, we had two of us making the stuff, and then we got enough money, and we bought a, we we bought an existing business. We didn't buy the business, but it was a walk in walk walk out kind of thing. She it was a pie shop. She had like extraction, a walk in fridge, this that the other. She walked out. We walked in, and then we really went hard. We went super hard because we couldn't afford it. Mm. We bought, we moved in, and it was just like we need to start fucking going hard. So it was like those early days again. But yeah, but we were really lucky, man. Like as we moved in, we got a really good customer. Like within, they approached us as well. To be fair, within like I think it was in the first six or eight weeks of, of getting the shop, they approached us, and we started. It was called Harris Farm. The company it's called Harris Farm in in New South Wales. They've got I think it's like thirty two stores. They said we'd like to put you in all our stores. No. So that was really, so that was really good. So that was like a huge cash flow injection when they started ordering. So that when we got that, that was, and they've ordered every week apart from like I think it was like two or three weeks since then. So it's been like nearly coming. I think it's like two and a half years they've ordered every week. So that was really, really good cash injection. That really pushed us forward. Mm. And then after that, just again, again, more, get more, get more. And like I keep saying, that snowball effect, it's really hard to roll a little snowball, a little pebble to get any momentum. But once you've got a decent sized one and you give it one push, you get heaps of snow on that snowball. It's the same thing. Once it gets going, then people start ringing you. Like we used to be, no one ever used to ring us. The phone mm. never rang, never fucking rang. 
there would be no one saying, can you supply us, can you supply us? But once you start getting a few, 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 they start talking, they're really good. Someone maybe leaves one shop, goes to another shop, takes you, say, oh, I left that shop. I've got this new shop. Can, can we put you in this shop? Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. And then people go into shops and start seeing you. Dane from the Grand Hyatt, he he was in uh, Leaf, which is a, a shop in uh, Brighton. He lives near there. And um, he's seen our terrain. He ate it. He loved it. He's the executive chef at the Hyatt. At the Hyatt. He got in touch and said, oh, I love that. Can I, can I get some? So when you're more around... More people start getting have a bit more confidence in you. So yeah, so and it's all about building that momentum, sort of one day at a time. Definitely one day at a time. Mm. Definitely, definitely. So I think it was a quote. It was a quote I heard, and this is where I, you could maybe frame that in the context of how you could use this in your everyday. So you know, you might be listening, thinking, "I don't have a business. I don't want to be a business owner." Well, think about it like this. I suppose everybody at some stage in their life probably wants to do better than what they are in some aspect. And the only way you're ever going to improve is through daily improvements. The thing is, starting is easy. Being consistent is not. But with the consistency, and as you've sort of outlined with how your business sort of scaled, it's, you gotta, it's, you gotta keep doing the same things. And then once you start getting the momentum, everything just starts to grow. And I guess it's really the same in life. If you want to sort of make any form of change or go somewhere, you have to build that momentum up one good day at a time and just always keep putting that work in. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly that. You just got to keep going. And like, it, yeah, if you think about running a marathon, it's fucking pretty daunting, but you know, you just, you just run a little bit and then run a little bit, train and train and train. And then, you know, before you know it, you can run a marathon. So when you were planning this all out, did you have the big picture sort of in your mind to begin with? Or did you just say, I've got this idea. I think I'd make a business. Things, and even now things change. You've got to be, you've got to be quite fluid. You know, you've just got to be at roll with it. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I've got an idea where we want to go now, but that might not be the idea it's going to be in two years time because mm-hmm. I will adjust. You've always got to adjust, you know. My actual idea was maybe sending logs to delis, like logs to terrines and logs to delis, logs to hotels, logs to outside caterers. And we do do that now, but it's a tiny percentage of what we do. We're actually heaps more retail, so much more retail. Like, I don't know the percentage accurately, but somewhere like 85% is retail. Mm. So and I didn't envisage that, but that we seen that going. And we weren't going to do a pate; we were just going to do terrains. Beck pushed me and said, "I think we should do a pate." And I was like, I was a bit apprehensive because I felt like all the pates on the market. There was a lot of pates on the market. Mm. Obviously, they weren't up to the same standard that we're at. But I just felt like there was a lot at the market. But she said, "I still think we can we can break that." Now that's a huge part of the business. I wouldn't have done it, but Beck said we should. I had faith in what she said, so we did it. So I didn't, we, I didn't envisage being retail as much as like pre-portioned. I thought it was going to be logs. We didn't, that didn't work. So then we went off, we went down that avenue. I didn't think we'd be doing pate, but we bet thought we did. So we went down that avenue. Do you know what I mean? Like it doesn't yeah. mean your big picture isn't like I've got to be there and that's what it's going to be. It might twist mm. completely different you've just got to roll with the punches and you can have a plan I think just have a plan to get you going and then see how it's going and then your next plan and then your next plan and then your next plan do you know what I mean and yeah. don't be like so rigid yeah you have to be fluid definitely so you can't just like have your mindset on one thing because you know you might have your mindset on that one idea but life might not take you that way exactly the opportunities might not open up exactly that first plan might go to absolute shit Definitely, and you, you might, yeah, exactly. I've heard so many stories, I kind of, you know, like, started off selling, building cars and end up building more bikes. Do you know what I mean? Like, who, you know what I mean? There's a lot of things that, that can happen. And there's always a chance of venting those stories as well that throws them completely off course. Yeah. And then, so, and what I want to ask you, so teamwork, you said, is very important. And, you know, you're talking about how your wife, Beck, so she's your business partner yeah. in this as well, yeah, yeah. how she's pushed you in certain directions. How important is having that good support when you're in business? Personally, mm. personally, because I've come from I've come from England with no friends, no family, just me and Beck, and that's it. So, like, I don't feel like I need that much support in that sense. But in relationships, you need, I felt like I would have needed a huge amount of support. Mm. By my, from my partner in my life partner, and then within the business, yeah, we we have we 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 very we're, we're quite lucky. We have very similar thoughts, and 
you've got a bit, I guess I'm a little bit more hard headed. Beck's a little bit more fluid. And we have different roles. Do you know what I mean? I'm mm. a bit more visionary. You know, I, I, I feel like I can know where the business is going. And Beck's a bit more like, um, holding it all together. A lot more holding it all together. Do you know what I mean? Without her, like, to get me on, e- get an email off me is like, you, you, it's very <laughs> unlikely you're going to get, maybe you get a message from Instagram or whatever. But like, all emails, even my emails are all Beck will sort all them out. All financials, zero. She'll show me the numbers. We'll go through the numbers sit, sitting down. We'll do predictions and forecasts and all that. she'll implement all that. I'll have a, a marketing idea. We'll speak about it. She'll implement it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that it's really important for us. We have, we both have our same roles. Like she wanted a pate. She couldn't make the pate, but she felt like we need a pate. So then I create the pate for, not for her, but for the business on her recommendation. So, you know, you've just got to work together and, so, and be prepared to lose. Like, I didn't want to make a pate. Which, mm-hmm. But then I had to say, well, you know, I'm not going to put a wall up and say, I'm not making one. It's not about me. It's about the business. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's almost it's like a little bit of an extra push. Yeah. It, well, it's just like, you've just got to be prepared not to have barriers and, and be like, okay, if let's try it. And if it works, it works. Like, no point me saying, I don't want to make a pate, then we're not going to make it. I am the boss. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I, I I'm a I'm a cog in the in in the in, I'm a wheel in the big picture. Do you know what I mean? A mm. cog in the machine. I'm not. If that, I can't be like a spoiled brat throwing my toys in out the pram. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We, we go together. And if I, if this hadn't worked, I wouldn't have said. I told you. That's not going to get us anywhere. And no. like, you know, if I say let's do something that doesn't work, she's not going to say I told you. We just go together. So I guess what we're saying is. It's very important to be as one and not blaming each other. I knew that wasn't going to work, so why didn't we want to do it? You know, you, you make a decision, even if you don't do it, you, you put your point across, they put their point across, you say, okay, let's do this, you move forward together, and if it works, it works together. If it fails, it fails together. It's as simple as that. And I think, you know, I just want to comment briefly, you know, I think that's it's quite nice and, and like very nice that you've got yourself a situation where, you know, you're working with your partner. So she's not only your life partner, which is your business partner, and you're able to work off each other like that. And it's not like um, one person is sort of, I suppose, taking all the control or anything along those lines. So, you know, just a... Just no, it's, I'm lucky for sure. I'm lucky. Mm-hmm. And I'm the harder one to work with. There's no two ways about it. Beck is super easy to work with. And I'm not so easy to work with. Because the way my mind works, the way I jump around, the way I want new ideas, new ventures, let's do this, let's do that, let's do the other. We were fucking, we were buying stuff from Queensland and distributing it from another, not three weeks ago, I did all this, little, no, maybe about eight weeks ago. I was on about getting a new fridge and this and that and the other. And she was like, oh, I don't know about this. This isn't, you know, and I'm like off fucking off to the races. <laughs> I'm doing it. And then. She was like, I'm not sure about this, but still supporting me all the way. And I don't know if this is a good idea. And then right at the end, I said, yeah, right, it's not a good idea. And we just scrapped the whole thing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. but like, I was, I was, but that happens all the time with me. Like, I'm fucking off to the races with Summit. Hmm. So, yeah. The original idea, though, did you come up with this together? Or? Mm, mm, I think it was my idea. Okay. I'm pretty sure it was my idea. But, like, do you think we should do this? Not like, this is what we're doing. It's like, do you think this is, do you think we should do this? We don't really have that many options. Mm. Which, uh, yeah. That was basically the, I think it was uh, as a whole my idea, but yeah, is the answer. Yeah. Yeah, it was my idea. So at the end of the day, teamwork definitely makes the dream work. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, definitely teamwork. And, I, and understanding each other, mm. understanding each other's needs. That's a thing. And it hasn't been easy. Fuck, it hasn't been easy. Mm. It's, it's difficult. Would you say your marriage has grown with the business as well? Yeah. And then a baby as well, you know. Yeah. A baby as well thrown in the mix. You've got to get strong. and Yeah, sometimes it's, it's, it's intense sometimes, you know. You've got things going on at work. Work, I say work. But things going on, it's quite high pressure. You, you, you're not fighting over, but like you, you're like, oh, we're pulling and pushing at one thing. And then you come home and then Monty, my son, he's maybe like being a bit of a bugger for doing something, you know, drawing or on something or a bit screaming and trying to keep you calm with that. And maybe Beck says something that I don't agree with or I say something that she doesn't agree with. So you've got the work disagreement, the kid disagreement, and then you've got to put all that. He goes to bed and you've got to put all that aside and be like, it's all cool. 
we'll, tomorrow we'll, we'll move on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Tomorrow's a new day, always. Tomorrow is always a new day, always. Mm. Don't hold any grudges the next day. That's right? business advice and marriage advice right there. Yeah, tomorrow's a new day. Let's just start again. Just wipe the slate clean. Let's go again. There's no point fucking holding grudges or whatever. Let's start a new day, fresh day. Let's get going. Yeah, and I've heard that before as just like like just general sort of like relationship advice. Like, you know, never go to bed on an argument. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Sometimes we will. We don't argue. We don't argue, you know, because I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Like, definitely. I'm rarely. If Beck is listening, you are in trouble. <laughs> I'm Does rarely she listen, right. she listen to your show? Yeah, bits and bobs. Bits and bobs. <laughs> She's fucking sick of listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> has to put up with it all day. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, speaking of your show, tell us about this show. Why did you start this show? A few reasons. One of the reasons, to be honest, it was because... It was because I was out of the kitchen and I was missing that kitchen crack that like, I felt like I put so much into it and then I was like, I would do my retail thing. I just missed that kind of interaction with the chefs mm. and and the food and, and, and the creative side like that. I did miss that. And I just miss, it, miss chatting to, to chatting food and chatting shop because that's basically all chefs do is talk about food. Um, mm. That was one reason. Uh, business point, standpoint, I thought it would be good to be represented with, I put a lot of effort in building relationships. Mm. So I kind of wanted to not show them off, like look at me, but like it kind of verified the standard of people that we associate with. We're not just cowboys just giving this a go. We've spent a lot of time in, in, um, in, build, in this industry, but spent a lot of time in this industry. And then I also felt like I didn't want to like sell my story, like, look at me, look at me. This is what I've done. This is what I've achieved. But I felt like over a duration of a podcast, over many, many episodes, many, many hours, people would get to know me and what I've done through that, as opposed to like on Instagram trying to say, this is what I've achieved. Look at me. Look what I can do. I just wanted people to gradually get to know me through that mm, yeah and then so the more specific focus on that is that very guest to guest does that have to do with like who your guest is in what sense what do you mean so like the main focus of it so it's called cooking the cooking the books cooking the books yeah oh the main yeah so yeah it's definitely guest to guest for sure so like we might have like people who produce honey rooftop honey we had them guys on who do like who have honey uh Hives all over the city on top of the high rises, mm. talking about honey, talking about honey laundering, talking about honey laundering, honey laundering. People who were mixing honey with glucose. Which, which episode? This might have to shout this out. Oh, I can't remember the number. It's it, rooftop honey is, is the people. Um, yeah, talking about that, you know, talking. So that episode was very specific about honey. Do you know what I mean? And, 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 and the, the, the the dodgy goings on around honey mm. and, uh, and whatnot, and how Australia is what I think it said it's the highest producing country in the world for honey, and then using honeys, exploiting honeys, bees being stolen, sorry, exploiting bees and bees being stolen from from people when they're out pollinating. They use bees literally to pollinate almond fields. You can, be, there's beekeepers that take their bees to different almond fields and let the bees pollinate. Them and then they take them away, they get paid for take, moving their bees around. So, you know, different. I don't know if people, many people know about these things that go on. No, exactly. this, is, this is news to me. Exactly. Like who, how do you think all the, the almond plant um, trees and that get pollinated? You know, no one's walking around rubbing them or whatever. They, use, they need bees to do that. Mm. So then people take their bees. There's documentaries on, you, on Netflix about these kind of things. And it happens here in Australia, obviously. Um, so just discussing that. So that episode was like that. Then it might be just like me with some friends like Tom Anglesey, who we've been friends forever. And he's had a really interesting career, worked some really high, high end chefs. We were just chatting shit with him or a friend of mine, Chris Eagle. He just lost 57 kilos in a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was all about his journey and losing weight and being a chef and trying to manage, juggle your time and train. And being surrounded by food and booze and trying mm. to cut that out and, and his journey with that. There's, there's so many. There were, there's so many. I said, you know, I think we've done 42 episodes now. You know? Like last week was the first episode of this season was with uh, about mushrooms, a guy that goes and picks mushrooms, 200 kilos at a time, and then delivers them to the restaurant, picks 
fennel pollen well, for the chefs so you see that's a little bit of fell and pollen he's actually hand picked all that with snakes and all sorts of, you know just all about the hospitality industry mm. cheesemongers brewers heaps of stuff it's a great show so if you go check out cooking the books you are going to find a wide variety yeah of hospitality chat mm. yeah. and then in terms so your business city larder so if people want to try out your products where can we find your products oh in Mel a lot of places uh, like a lot, a lot of high end or even just independent, should I say? Not high end, but independent butchers, independent, uh, supermarkets, Leo's, Boccaccio's, Peter Boucher's as a butcher's, David Jones, Peter Boucher's, Canning's, a lot of the, the more independents. Mm. Um, yeah, a lot of independent grocers, butchers, and supermarkets. Independents. Mm. Yeah. Sorry. sorry, no, 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 you're all right. Yeah, like IGAs. <laughs> All right, and finally, Robbie, what is next for you and for City Larders? Mm, we are looking to just keep growing. We are looking to employ some more staff. We're looking at the market to re- release these new um, ready-to-go proteins. And I want to, actually, I want to ask on that. I forgot to ask earlier. Is that going to be more of like a product sort of maybe for you targeting it? Maybe people to go to the gym because you mentioned yeah, proteins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess it is, yeah. The, the, the good quality protein, like beef cheek, uh, pork belly, high in fat, uh, good for the keto. Yeah, I did a fair bit of keto. Yeah, good, good diet. for the keto. Um, and then duck. Yeah, I guess gym, not really. We're, we've, um, we're definitely not a, a, a health brand. We're not a no. health brand. We're not trying to be a health brand. We're a, we're a luxurious treat yourself brand, but mm. done right. You know what I mean? No added sugars and no added flavors and all these kind of things. It's just good food, good restaurant food done to, for you to enjoy at home, basically, is what it is. And it's designed for people who don't want to have ready meals, like them pre-packaged yeah. ready meals. No knocking them, whatever they are, what they are, but they have... They're a bit rubbish. <laughs> they are, they've, they've got a lot of added additives and sugars and things in them, high salt and this, that, the other in them. Where this is like a good piece of protein, ready cooked, ready to go in 30 minutes. And all you might have to do is saute some vegetables or put the rice cooker on and blend some green beans or, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. or put the rice cooker on, have a good kimchi and you might just go rice, kimchi, half an avocado and you've got the pork belly, you might, or the duck leg you're just going to drop on top. So that you sort out the bottom bit, a little bit of a take on HelloFresh. Yeah. But you do your shopping and you grab the protein because ultimately the protein is the hard bit to cook. That's yeah. the, you know, that's the most difficult bit. So we'll take care of that and you just add your, your garnish, we would say, in the restaurant industry. So you're bringing the restaurant quality to the kitchen. Well, we're bringing to restaurant the home quality kitchen. exactly to the home kitchen for you to enjoy on your time. So, you know, you can have it in the, in the afternoon or you can have it sat in front of the telly or in a, in a, in a, in a dinner party environment, that kind of thing. Yeah. And we try to make it so the very, uh, you can utilize them in lots of different ways. You know, the pork belly, you could just have it as a one roasted piece with some vegetables or what, however you, you know, or whatever, or you could dice it up and put it in a saute and put it in a pasta. Mm-hmm. The duck leg you could shred down and put in a salad or again in like a ragu where you could roast it whole and the, and the beef cheek you could dice up and put in a pie or in a, in a, in a risotto or them kind of things. No, I really like this idea. Plenty of options as well. Mm. I hope it's within my price range. I definitely want to check this out. <laughs> yeah, well, it, look, it's not cheap. Things aren't, things aren't fucking cheap. No. You know, especially when we're using organic beef and we're using free range pork and mm. we're using homemade lard and we, you know, red wine and these things aren't for free. And then we've got to pay the staff mm. by the hour. These, you know, everyone's got to be paid well, as you've probably heard on the, on the news that everyone, wage theft and all that. You've got to pay everyone super and tax and, da, 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 and everyone, we've got to make a little bit of money. The retailer's got to make a little bit of money. Like, fucking, how cheap do you want it? Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. That's right. the reality. Like, yeah. people, you can go to the, a local takeaway, but is that free range? Are you looking after local supply? Is that chicken battery farmed and shit and going to some big corporation where they're just looking after the shareholders? Or are you going to a small farm and enjoying a piece of pork that's been made in a, in a farm which hasn't got any shareholders, which put back into the, into the environment, back into the economy? Or, or 
you know, you go into an independent grocers or an independent butchers as opposed to like Woolies or Coles and they're supporting the local community. Do you know what I mean? It depends what mm. you want. Yeah. I'm all about the local, all about the small independents, farmers markets and these kind of things. It's just the way I am. It's what I'm into. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing these days. I mean, I suppose there's like a whole wide range of issues in terms of like food, how it's produced. And I mean, I mean, for me myself, like I try to buy the best quality food that I can from time to time, but you know, living week to week, that can be difficult. That's, it can be difficult for yeah. sure. It can be different, difficult, but it depends where, where you are. But also I don't, you know, like you're walking around with a fucking, you know, a thousand dollar iPhone and yeah. saying you're struggling for cash. Do you know what I mean? Or you're walking around a brand new Air Max and telling me you're struggling for cash. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It depends where you are. And I don't knock people for that. I'm not knocking them. I mm. understand that it's not. I drink fucking, you know, like I might, I drink $20 bottle of wine mm. where some people think it, you should be drinking $60 bottle of wine. That's their preference. Do you know what I mean? Like each to their own, isn't it? Each yeah. to their own. It's one of those each to their own, but yeah. It is. And I don't judge anyone for that. But I like that point you made, you made just then, you know, people who could say, go around saying they're shopping for money, you've got a thousand dollar iPhone. So I'll, I'll, on that note, I just want to say, you know, never forget to be grateful for what you have. I think that's something that gets lost a little bit in this world. Yeah. And you've got health. Yeah. Health is wealth. And that is the fact. All right. I think that would be a good note to end on. I think my camera is about to run out of space. Robbie, this has been an absolute pleasure. Beautiful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very Don't much. Don't forget to check out Cooking the Books. Beautiful.